Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first of the Pitts Theology Library weekly workshops for fall 2020. My name is Brady Beard, and I am the reference and instruction librarian at Pitts Library, and I'm joined today by my colleague Anne-Marie McLean, the reference and reference librarian and outreach coordinator at Pitts. We are so excited to have you joining us today to talk about uh, research and beginning the research process. Just a couple of quick housekeeping things as we begin. Feel free to use the chat on the right-hand side of the video to say hello or introduce yourself. If you have any questions uh, that you would like to ask during the session, please use the Q&A tab right next to the chat feature. And next to the Q&A tab, you will find the handout of the slideshow that we are discussing today. With that, I think we'll go ahead and get started. So the research process really has four major steps. And before I begin talking about those steps, I want to give you some insight into what I think are three habits of successful researchers. First, the successful researcher is someone who is flexible, who learns from what works and what doesn't, and can apply that knowledge to new research projects or experiences or even new databases. The successful researcher also strives for accuracy. One thing we'll talk about in a little bit is the reality that sometimes databases or library catalogs don't always use the same words or phrases uh, or even themes or subjects that we might use uh, to classify information. And so part of the struggle is sometimes just being accurate in terms of shared terminology between yourself as the researcher and the database that you're re, uh, that you're using. And then finally, successful researchers are individuals who are persistent and who continue uh, to work at the research process and always improve, but also to just keep trying to push through even when uh, doors may seem to close, but to try a window or another way into the problem. So the research process, as I said, can be broken down into sort of four steps that we'll talk about today. The first step is identification. This is really pretty straightforward. The first thing you'll want to do is figure out what you're being asked to do in the assignment or which topics you might want to uh, pursue. This can be something related to your own interests or even related to the expectations of the professor or the instructor in, your, in a particular course that you're enrolled in. The second step is to begin collecting information. And this is where those sort of habits of accuracy and flexibility really come into play. You will be tasked with finding information on the topic and wading through the variety of resources that might be applicable to your search. The next step is to evaluate. Once you have found the information, you need to figure out not only what is relevant to my topic, but if the information you have is the best available information for your project. And you'll want to rethink your project in light of some of the uh, information that you've come across. And then finally, the presentation aspect of the, the research process. This is where it all comes together. Major things you want to be thinking about in the presentation stage are the identification of your audience, who are you writing for, what your conclusion is, and how can you arrange your materials, whether that's your own argument or the sources that you've come across to best support your argument. So let's talk about these steps in a little, a little more in depth. Let's look at the identification process first. The first thing you want to do is to understand the assignment or the task at hand. If you're writing a paper for a faculty member or uh, in a, for a particular class, you'll usually see that the professor has additional instructions about the project and their own expectations in the syllabus. So the first thing you want to do is to do a close reading of what you're being asked to do with the assignment. Then in light of that, you can begin to look for key words in the project description. For instance, are you being asked to analyze a problem or to compare problems or perhaps histories or something like that to evaluate uh, another person's uh, 
argument or another person's research or to argue for your own original thought. Then you're going to want to develop a research question. A research question is different from a thesis, and a research question is really simply a guiding question that's going to help you get into the topic at hand. One good way to develop a research question is to follow the steps on this slide. So for step one, identify what you are working on. You can do this as simply as filling out the rest of this sentence. I am working on X. This could be the topic that's described in the assignment, or if you're doing the research for uh, a thesis or your own long-term plans, you might want to look into something that excites you or something that puzzles you. You should give a reason to the project that you're working on. Often this can simply be done by identifying why you want to work on that topic. This is the centerpiece of the research that you're doing. This is where you're going to ask yourself why and how. And as you go through the research process, this question will continually be, re, uh, continually be refined. And then finally, the conclusion is often where we get to the so what. Why is the question important? It's best if you have a question that is broadly applicable and could be imagined to be important to people other than just yourself, but sometimes that's not always the case. So don't be afraid of asking yourself the so what question. You might be wondering, don't I need a thesis? I've heard through all of my academic career that I need to have thesis-driven work. Well, the answer is pretty simple. Not all assignments require a thesis, but the thesis statement often comes after you formulate a research question, and it's often the answer to the question that you originally posed. So my suggestion is to let the research question guide your research, and it will form the backbone of your project. And that as you begin to find uh, items in the collection or in databases, and you begin to answer the question, at that point, you'll begin to develop a thesis around which you can organize the rest of your project. But as I uh, and Anne-Marie uh, encourage all of the folks who come to the reference desk at Pitts Library and ask for assistance in their research projects, we encourage you all to start with a question and to hold it loosely. Be willing to be flexible based on what information you will find. So after you develop your research question, the next step is to analyze the question and to figure out if it's something that you can accomplish. This is really uh, the idea of making a manageable research question. Not all questions can be answered in a 10 or 50 or even 200 page research project. And so you'll want to be sure that your question can be answered in the space that the assignment allows. So this might look like uh, doing a study or a project on a particular chapter or selection of verses from the Gospel of John instead of the entire book of John, or maybe a single Augustine sermon rather than the entirety of his confessions. And remember, as you go through the collection process, your research question will become more and more refined as you learn what the scholarly conversation is or has been around your research question. So the three steps for identification are pretty straightforward. First, you need to understand the assignment or understand what it is you're being asked to do. Then you'll want to develop a research question, something that's personally interesting to you that has a nice so what conclusion to it. And then whether or not that project or that question is doable within the confines of the assignment. So let's talk about collecting information then. The good news is that you can often start where you are when it comes to collecting information. So what do I mean by start where you are? Well, I mean to use the tools that you already have. These could be assigned readings that a professor or faculty member has uh, given to you or discussed either in class or maybe in a conversation outside of class. A good place to start are your textbooks, course reserves, articles, and other readings that have been assigned, perhaps class handouts, you can use your lecture notes uh, to help you figure out where to begin. And then I always recommend that you take a look at your syllabus. 
faculty members work really hard to give more readings than you'll ever be able to do in the course of a semester. And you will likely find a, a nice bibliographic selection in your course syllabi, or maybe even recommended readings that are in addition to the required readings. And so these are all great places to start doing your research. Then you'll want to consider the tools that the library already has. Notice I'm not quite talking about the library catalog yet, but the library has things like research guides on over 60 topics that could help you get started on your research project. Like this workshop, we have workshops on a variety of subjects, so you might want to check out the workshops page to see if we have any information about uh, topics related to your interests. You can also find online bibliographies at uh, the Emory Databases collection to help you begin guiding your research work. And then finally, you might want to check the catalog. We'll take a look at what the catalog looks like in just a moment. Or, of course, you can always chat with one of the reference librarians by visiting us at pitts.emory.edu slash ask. So, now we want to think about finding general overviews for the topic that you might have. And you'll want to think about the different types of materials that are available to you. There are really three different types of materials that uh, researchers use, and those can be identified as primary, secondary, and tertiary resources. A primary resource is something like a newspaper article, or an original sermon, or maybe even a biblical book or novel. These are things that come from a particular point in time and are often from a particular author that people are interested in studying. Secondary resources are works that are written about the primary resources. So some examples of a secondary resource might be a commentary on the Book of Ruth, for example, or maybe an essay on a selection of sermons or preaching styles, or even journal articles about a novel or um, a primary text. Tertiary uh, materials, by contrast, are summaries of the secondary sources. Tertiary materials are a good place to go to begin to understand what has the scholarly conversation been around a particular topic or primary resource that you're interested in studying. So tertiary resources might include things like dictionaries, companions, you might be familiar with, say, the Cambridge Companion series, or maybe the Wiley Blackwell uh, handbooks to different topics, or even encyclopedia entries. Let's take a closer look at some tertiary materials. So like I said, tertiary materials include dictionaries, encyclopedias, handbooks, source books, and other online reference materials. Tertiary materials are very often the sorts of things you'll find in a reference collection. Once you have identified some of those materials, uh, thinking about the tertiary materials that you might want to use, now it's time to follow the bibliographic rabbit trail. So here's an example of an entry in the New Interpreter's Bible Dictionary. This entry is for the word widow, so we might be interested in doing a research project on widows in the Hebrew Bible, and so this would be a good place to start. The first thing you'll notice is that the English entry is immediately met with definitions from the original biblical languages, uh, in this case, uh, Hebrew and Greek, and then a short explanatory paragraph on those key terms. You'll also notice that there are uh, other Bible verses that you can begin exploring to see where widows are talked about in the biblical text. Most dictionaries and encyclopedia entries, especially those that deal with primary documents in uh, languages other than English, will provide this sort of definition to help you get going. They will also provide suggestions for other entries in that dictionary uh, to look at if you're interested. So you'll see here the first example on the entry widows is for this other article in this dictionary on order of widows. 
in this particular dictionary, the references are capitalized when they're pointing you toward another entry in the same publication. Sometimes dictionaries might use italics or they'll mark it off with bolds uh, or underline it even. Uh, but just look for those sorts of things because that can help you sort of broaden your scope a little bit, especially right at the beginning. And uh, you'll see that that, is, that runs all the way through to the end of this particular dictionary entry where they're all sort of piled in at the end where that third arrow is. At the very bottom of every dictionary entry, you'll see a short bibliography that the author used to help them create this particular entry. This can be a really great starting place uh, for you, and you don't even have to go to the library catalog yet. These things are usually listed either alphabetically or uh, in terms of relevance or even chronology. So this particular entry um, is listed alphabetically, and it just so happens that it's also listed in reverse chronological order. So you can look up these particular items. So you'll see that this uh, book, A Feminist Companion to the Deuteropauline Pauline Epistles by Amy Jill Levine and Marianne Blickenstaff was the first item in the bibliography entry for widows in the New Interpreter's uh, Bible Dictionary. And um, this is useful because you can immediately start flipping through this particular book to look at the footnotes to see what sorts of things these authors have been citing and reading. And you can even skim their bibliography to look for relevant titles that might be of interest to you or to identify authors who work on this subject or related topics. Remember, we've done all of this without even really breaking into the library catalog yet. So now you might have a collection of keywords, authors, or even titles that you can use to go look in the catalog for um, materials related to your research project. You'll want to use a couple of searching tricks when you use the library catalog, and I've demonstrated them for you in this particular image. Here I've searched for women and Paul and the New Testament, and I've used a whole bunch of different tools that will be useful for you. The first tool that I used is called Boolean logic. Boolean logic are the capitalized and, or, or not search commands. By using these capitalized words, you're basically telling the catalog precisely what you're looking for. So if I wanted to find uh, materials on women and Paul, but I didn't want to look for items related to women in the New Testament, I could search women and Paul, not New Testament. Or if I wanted to see if there was anything about women and Paul or the New Testament, I could use the or command and the catalog would be able to follow those commands and to use those to search more effectively. Boolean logic can be applied outside of the library catalog to things like Google and uh, JSTOR and ATLA and other search databases that I'll talk about momentarily. The other trick that you see is that I used um, truncation and wildcard search. The wildcard search is uh, when a searcher uses a question mark to replace a particular character in a word. In this case, I wanted the library catalog, I wanted to look in the library catalog for women and woman. And I used the question mark to replace the E and the A. So now the, lib the, the catalog search will identify anything that meets those criteria. You could also use the truncation uh, search by using an asterisk, which would let you look for anything that has W-O-M at the beginning of the word. And so in this, if we were to use that search, we would find things like women, woman, perhaps womb, uh, and all sorts of other words that begin with W-O-M. And then if you have phrases that you want to search together and not as individual keywords, it's important to use quotations to mark off the phrase. So here you'll see that I put quotation marks around the words New and Testament. And that's because I want the catalog to only return results 
for the phrase New Testament. And I don't want to see things that have the word new or testament in them. And so if you're looking for um, phrases or uh, ideas or themes that have multiple words in that in it, you'll want to set it off with quotation marks to limit the phrase to the exact um, to limit the search to the exact phrase that you've identified. Like I said, um, truncation, wildcard searching, and phrasing can also work in your Google searches as well. Once you identify an item that looks like it might be useful, you can further uh, get accuracy in the library catalog by using the subject headings in the search results. So you'll see I opened this record from our search, Women, Woman, and Paul, and New Testament. And this item, Let the Oppressed Go Free, Feminist Perspectives on the New Testament, looked particularly useful. And once I opened the record, I could see down in the subject headings and there I see women in the Bible, women in Christianity, history, early church, feminist theology, liberation theology, sociology, biblical, Bible, New Testament, criticism, interpretation, etc. These subject headings are the way, uh, these are the limiters that the catalog is using to classify this particular item. All of these in the library catalog are hyperlinked, and so you could click on any one of them for instance, women in the Bible, and it would run a search for items that have that exact subject header or subject heading in the record for the item. So this is another good way to limit your search results and to gain accuracy by connecting your, uh, your needs with the way that the library catalog is organizing materials. Another trick is to shelf read. Usually, uh, when the library is open for in-person uh, visitation and patrons have access to the stacks, people are able to find one item and go down and just look at the shelves to see what other items are nearby. If you know anything about the library call numbers, you know that they are organized by subject. And so things that are like each other get grouped together. This can be another really effective way to run a search. But in this particular semester, the library shelves are off limits to patron usage. And so you might be wondering, how can I see what else is nearby these particular books that I'm interested in? And the answer is really simple. We have a virtual browse option that you can use to look for items related to a book that looks like it might be particularly useful to you. And so we encourage you to use the virtual browse feature as well. Once you find uh, items in the catalog that are uh, that look like they will be relevant to your project, the next step will be requesting the books and finding out which library they're in so you know where to pick them up. You can find more information about uh, pickup services for fall 2020 at the pits.emory.edu homepage. Uh, but for now, just know that by selecting physical resources in each record, you can figure out where the book is and where you need to go to collect the item that you're interested in. So we've looked at tertiary materials as a way of getting in to the research project and to developing a bibliography for your topic. We've explored searching the catalog to help you find materials related to your research. And now let's talk about other resources that might be of interest to you. You might expand your research by looking up those authors or titles from the bibliographies and footnotes that you've looked at, either in tertiary materials or when you pulled uh, a book like uh, A.J. Levine's book on feminist biblical interpretation. So for instance, you might be interested in tracking down uh, some of these authors, but you might also consider using some of the keywords or phrases that appeared in your rabbit trail work. So uh, if you'll remember, when we looked up widows, we had all of these other options to continue searching. Order of widows, domestic codes, New Testament marriage. You might try these phrases in a keyword search in the library catalog. 
or you might use the subject headings that you've seen in other entries in the library catalog. For instance, women in the early church, women in Roman law, or older women. From there, you can begin expanding your search to all of the other databases that Emory holds subscriptions to. Emory holds subscriptions to over uh, to almost 1,100 different databases, and you can find these by visiting the databases at Emory page from the pits.emory.edu homepage. And uh, in the databases, some particularly useful databases for Candler students includes uh, Atla, JSTOR, Soch Index, Academic Search Complete, and ProQuest dissertations. ATLA and JSTOR are particularly useful for humanities research, including theology and religion. ATLA is uh, devoted mostly to Judeo-Christian um, uh, subjects. JSTOR will have a lot of materials related to um, all sorts of religious questions. Soch Index is really a sociological and demographic research collection. Academic Search Complete will search a host of uh, databases for you. And then ProQuest Dissertations is where you can find uh, dissertations published or unpublished dissertations from uh, around the world, not just at Emory. Other online resources that you might consider using would be Google Books, Google Scholar, and the Internet Archive. Particularly in the fall of 2020, ebooks are uh, really important. And Google Books and the Internet Archive are a great place to go to search to see if an item is available as an ebook if the Emory Libraries doesn't hold that item. So um, we encourage you to look there. For Internet Archive, you will have to create your own free account to borrow ebooks from them, but it's a really quick setup and can be a really useful way to build out your bibliography. So for collecting information related to your research project. Start where you are. Use the materials that you already have, textbooks, syllabi, lecture notes, etc. Find a general overview of the topic, either in tertiary materials or um, bibliographies that are available online to you through the Emory databases. Follow the bibliographic rabbit trail to begin building your bibliography. Look to see what other scholars and researchers are citing and uh, see if it's helpful for you. And then expand your search to new databases and to new search engines uh, and modify your search by using some of those new phrases, new keywords, new authors, new subjects that you've discovered along the way. Finally, you need to evaluate the resources that you have uncovered. As you think about evaluating your sources, there are some important questions to keep in mind. The first question is always to ask about the creator. What, is the, what are the credentials that the author or the publisher might hold that makes them an authority on this particular topic? For instance, if you were writing a research paper on something related to the study of physics, you might want to focus your research to scholars who work in the field of physics rather than someone who works in psychology or sociology, for instance. So think about the creator, think about what their credentials are, and ask questions about why they have authority. Uh, these questions can be asked of individual authors, but it's often good to ask those questions about the publishers as well. Then you might want to ask how well was the item received in the scholarly debates? For instance, was the article or the book peer reviewed? If it was, what do people have to say about it? If an item was peer reviewed, it, you'll find it in um, a source like ATLA or ATLA or JSTOR where you can limit your searching to peer reviewed articles. Peer review simply means that other scholars have read this item and they have um, agreed that it fits within the scholarly conversation, both in terms of style, tone, and subject, but also in its demonstration of expertise in the questions at hand. 
book reviews can be a really useful way of beginning to understand how a book was received in the scholarly field. And so you can use, uh, you can find book reviews by visiting a uh, uh, index and a journal index like Atla or JSTOR and limiting your search to book reviews and then searching for that particular uh, title. And then you can get into understanding what the scholarly conversations and debates have been by looking at tertiary materials like dictionaries and encyclopedias or by uh, sometimes reading dissertations. I've mentioned that you can find dissertations at ProQuest dissertations in the Emory databases. And so if you're particularly interested in knowing what, say, the last 10 years of conversation on a particular topic have been, a recent dissertation is a really good way to go about understanding that. The other thing you'll want to think about is when was an item published? If it was published, say, in 1970, that was several years ago now. And so the scholarly conversation has probably changed and the discipline might have even changed itself. So ask yourself, when was the item last published? Has it undergone any major revisions or um, editing? For instance, is there a second or third edition of the book that might uh, be more reflective of where the sort of scholarly conversation is now? Then think about the audience. Who is this work for? Is it for a scholarly conversation or is it more for a popular audience. And you can usually tell who the intended audience is by paying attention to how widely available the material is, um, where it was published. Is it published um, in a scholarly journal or is it published on a blog or website? And then what does the style of the writing tell you about who the audience might be? And then finally, one last really important thing, especially when you find materials online that you might be interested in using in your research is to ask who is profiting from this research and how. So one thing you'll notice as you sort of begin the research process is that there's a lot of information out there online and it's not all equally vetted for academic purposes. And one way you can tell that perhaps an item is not necessarily intended for academic audiences is if that website or web page is full of all sorts of advertisements um, and uh, maybe there's no indication that it's connected to a university or the scholarly conversation at all. So I encourage you as you begin sort of poking around online, just ask yourself those questions around um, who is making money off of this particular item that I'm looking at right now? And how are they making money from it? And that will give you some insight into whether or not uh, that particular item is intended for an academic audience or whether it has another audience in mind. And then you'll want to reevaluate your research question. You can imagine that uh, when you start with a research question and you go and you look and you begin gathering materials related to your topic, that you very quickly realize that your question needs to be, uh, needs to shift a little bit. And so as you have all of that research sitting in front of you, you'll want to reevaluate your question. Usually one of two things happens. Your research question is either too broad or it's too narrow. Uh, more often than not, the research question is far too broad. And so we encourage you to limit your research to one particular author or one particular book, maybe to limit it to one time period or one specific method or hermeneutic. And if you really can't limit it to one thing, then try perhaps a comparative approach where you're comparing two things. Less common is the too narrow option, and this, this happens, but it is less common than the too broad approach. And so when something is too narrow, you want to maybe zoom back out a little bit and look at your question within a larger context or consider similar themes in other authors or books and to track changes over time. How has the research question developed in the scholarly conversation? So evaluate, evaluate your sources and evaluate your question based on your collection results. And then finally, begin preparing to present your materials. The important thing is to pick the right fit. Uh, 
every time you go to start a new project, you want to ask yourself some basic questions about what type of assignment you are doing. Is it an academic research paper? Is it a reflection paper? Maybe it's a sermon or an op-ed or other, sort, other type of public facing research. All of these different types of uh, presentations will require different tones, different styles, and even different argumentation and evidence. So you'll want to plan your project once you identify the types of materials that you, or I'm sorry, once you have the type of project identified. Uh, so map it out. Identify what your argument is. At this point in the research process is where you begin moving from the research question to the research thesis, to the thesis statement. So identify what your argument is. Argue your point in good faith. That means being a good, fair reader of the other sources that you're using and employing your evidence well. And then pre present a meaningful conclusion. This is the why of it all. Why does your argument matter? What does it change about how we might think about the larger topic at hand? And of course, as you uh, interact with sources, you need to be paying attention to citation. There are lots of different citation styles out there. You might be familiar with MLA or APA from undergrad. If you have a background in religion and theology, you've probably heard of Chicago or Turabian style. The Society of Biblical Literature even has its own style that's a slight modification of Chicago and Turabian. My recommendation is to pick one and stick with it until you perfect it. Most of the time during uh, your research in the areas of religion and theology at Candler, you're going to be asked to write in Chicago or Turabian. So just now, right now, decide that you're going to write all of your papers in Chicago style. Familiarize yourself with the Chicago Manual of Style and just stick with it. It will get easier the more you use it. If a professor says they don't care what style you use as long as you're consistent, just decide you're gonna use Chicago style. This will help you become more effective as a researcher across all of the work that you're doing. The other thing you can do to become as effective as possible is to use a citation software like Zotero or EndNote. Uh, we have a Zotero uh, workshop that you can watch online at the Pitts Big Marker website. Uh, and you'll find that at pitts.emory.edu slash workshops. Other resources that can be of great help to you include the Purdue Online Writing Lab or OWL. Uh, this will have examples of citation and other sorts of materials uh, for sort of doing the formal aspect of an academic writing uh, assignment, margins, um, you know, footers, headers, headings within the paper, title pages, all of that stuff you can find at Purdue. You can also make an appointment with uh, writing help at the Emory Writing Center or the Candler Writing Center, and these folks will be able to help you perfect your uh, your paper and your your writing practices. You might also be interested in getting started by uh, looking at what sorts of things the library offers. I've already mentioned the library guides and the library workshops. We encourage you always to start from the library guides in a particular uh, research topic. And if it's a topic we don't know much about, we will often use the guides to help answer your questions. Uh, the Pitts library guides are fully vetted by the faculty librarians and graduate students at Emory, and so we um, commend them to you as a useful uh, resource. Pitts Library has lots of workshops available online just like this one, and you can watch those recordings um, either in person or uh, you, can, you can watch um, at a later date. You can always ask us by visiting pitts.emory.edu ask and a reference librarian or reference staff member will help you get started. You can schedule a consultation over Zoom to begin formulating that research question. Or you might consider looking at some of the, re the Woodruff Library guides for research. And Woodruff has um, 
lots and lots of guides on a variety of topics that go above and beyond even the 70 or so research guides that Pitts has. So with that, uh, if anybody has any questions, feel free to um, jump over to the Q&A and, um, and you can ask your questions and Anne-Marie and I will do our best to answer them. I see we've had a few questions about alumni access to the library. Um, and we have, uh, as Anne-Marie has mentioned in the chat, we do have an entire webinar on how to um, access library resources for alumni. And that recording is available on our website. Um, in fall of 2020, the library and in fact, the entire university campus is limited to uh, students, faculty and staff who have been cleared to come on to campus. And this of course is uh, in adherence to health guidelines regarding the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, but we have a lot of online resources that uh, you can use from wherever you are, and those can be found. Instructions for accessing those alumni resources can be found at pitts.emory.edu slash alums. As always, you can reach us by uh, visiting pitts.emory.edu slash ask. And from 10 to 3, we have a live chat feature five days a week, Monday through Friday. And a reference staff member will be able to help you out immediately. And if you message us um, you know, before 10 AM or after 3 PM, uh, you will get an email response uh, quickly. And so we encourage you to visit pits.emory.edu slash ask if you have any additional questions. We look forward to uh, seeing you all and hearing from you about your research projects and your research questions as the semester progresses. Thanks for joining us today and don't be afraid to reach out if you have any additional questions. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.